return home with our shields or upon them for Sparta and for her dead. Spartan Total Warrior released in 2005 for the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube. The hack and slash gameplay, ancient Greek setting, and the presence of Ares himself certainly points to this being a God of War clone, but considering that God of War came out earlier in that same year, it's highly doubtful Spartan Total Warrior took much inspiration from it. That being said, if you only owned an Xbox or a GameCube when you were younger, this may have satiated that craving of slaying a Hydra while collecting blue energy orbs. The developers for this game are Creative Assembly, most known for the Total War series, but they have two internal design teams. The one that had been developing niche sports games like Australian Rules Football and Cricket had just finished up on Rugby and had a passionate desire to do anything other than sports for their next project. Since Creative Assembly was working on Rome Total War around that time, they felt it would be a waste to not use some of that research for an action-adventure game. A big focus was to keep the scale of their previous games, to maintain those big epic battles, but this time let the player control a godlike super character that could slay thousands all by himself. With that in mind, having the Spartans be the main protagonists makes perfect sense. Creative Assembly have previously shown thorough dedication to historical accuracy in their games, and it may seem like that standard isn't being upheld here. I mean, it should be pretty clear at this point, but the reasoning makes sense. The expectations set from their previous games put pressure on the Spartan team, so instead of trying to adhere to any sort of accuracy, they threw it all out the window to embrace the mythological. This is established basically immediately, as in the first mission, Ares is introduced to the player as an ally, and that same mission ends with the player fending off the giant bronze automaton, Talos. Leaning into this tone makes perfect sense considering the genre shift. I'm not claiming you couldn't make a historically correct action game, but grounding the setting in myth opens the door for magic attacks, boss fights that utilize already established beasts and gods, and outstanding grandiose set pieces that literally wouldn't work any other way. Of course, the Medusa beam shining down from the heavens is a phenomenal visual, one that I suspect will remain ingrained in my brain for years to come, but even ignoring that aspect, it's downright impressive that these epic battles are even able to function like they do. It's frankly hard to believe this many enemies can fit on a GameCube game at once, especially considering that they all seem to act independently from one another. Creative Assembly wanted big epic battles, and there are plenty of times where they gave players nothing less. It's also worth noting that I barely ever saw any stutters or frame dips, even when I exploded or launched every enemy in a 20-foot radius. Performance-wise, the game is top-notch. Well, that is until we discuss the cutscenes. It doesn't happen in every scene, but on a lot of the camera cuts, there will be a transitional blank white screen, which never goes unnoticed from me. It isn't so bad that it becomes disorienting or anything like that, but it certainly is jarring, especially when it happens multiple times in succession during a few specific cutscenes. I will say, one really great quality of these cutscenes was being able to pause them. This should be the standard in every game, so it's nice to see a title from this era have this quality of life nicety. It's also nice to see them include subtitles. However, there is a small issue with them, but I think it has more to do with the sound design itself. The lines of dialogue sometimes have unusually large gaps between them. So large, in fact, that the subtitles go off screen before the character is finished talking. Ha! But not anymore! It's alright to look at her. I've channeled all her power into this weapon, and what power it is! You'd never think anything so delicate could be used in such a way. Since we're on the topic of the dialogue, oh my goodness, I love this game. Of course we have the not-so-great performances and cutscenes, like when Pollux celebrates after defeating the Romans. Yeah! Victory is ours! We beat the might of the Roman Empire! Or when Pollux reacts to Rome being taken over. No! You're lying! Or when Castor reacts to Pollux dying. Doesn't he ever stay down? No! Wait, brother! We'll charge him together! <laughs> no! <laughs> you Roman filth! 
He wasn't destined to die yet! Spoilers, by the way. What's better, though, are the voice lines during gameplay. Not only are they cheesy and over the top, they are sometimes said ad nauseum, which only adds to the hilarity of it all. That's genuinely a really funny way to say that line, but hearing it as much as I did put me into a fit of hysterical laughter that I doubt the designers were intending. Caster announcing that he'll take care of the gate every single time you encounter a gate, only for him not to open the gate are just perfect moments in time. I'll take care of the gate. You keep quiet. Besides the dialogue, the other sound effects aren't bad, but their placements, or lack thereof, just feels comedic, as if it was a conscious decision to make the player laugh. Every time the Spartan gets thrown by a big enemy, he has this gut-wrenching scream that lasts precisely as long as he's airborne. It's as if we're listening to the middle of a larger yell, coming in right after the beginning and cutting it off before the end. The lack of any sort of noise when in the city level, when there isn't music playing in the background, feels really eerie. Berries. I feel it. I'm not sure why they couldn't have included some hustle and bustle sound effects here and there. When the music does play in the background, it's usually pretty great, actually. It all comes down to personal taste, of course, but I found myself jamming out to them. This may be an incredibly niche reference that barely any of you will understand, but it reminds me of the banger menu music on the Blu-ray releases of Dragon Ball Z. Unfortunately, finding those songs online at this point is near impossible for some reason, but Season 3's music is somehow still not taken down, so I'd recommend giving it a listen. Getting back to the game now, the last sound design bit I want to mention is the Crassus boss fight. He's captured Medusa and is utilizing her for her powers. Every time the beam shines down, there's an incredible audio cue that plays right before it. You can practically hear the agony that this device is inflicting on the helpless Medusa. It gives the battle a horror tone that I don't think it would have had otherwise. The combat is the real meat and potatoes of Spartan Total Warrior, and it's surprisingly solid. On the surface, it's pretty simple. You mash the attack button to victory. After a while, enemies with bigger shields can block your attacks, so you'll need to break their guard with a shield bash. If the red circle in the upper left-hand corner is over halfway full, you can perform a rage attack that's usually an instant kill. You also have a bow, meaning you can shoot enemies from far away if you have enough arrows. Once you get the Blades of Athena, you'll get access to magical power attacks, which can be triggered if you have a full tank of energy at the top. What's even more interesting is that everything I just said is just one of the two variations of that move. You can press the B button instead of the A button, and your regular attack will be a sweeping maneuver which can take out hordes of enemies at once, your shield bash will be able to push many enemies back to give you some breathing room, your rage attack switches to a powerful multi-enemy maneuver, you can shoot five arrows at once with your bow, and your power attack is modified to suit crowd control in favor of more damage to a single foe. Adding on to all that, you can also perform a roll to get behind enemies, fatally stab them when they're on the ground, and you can use many environmental objects such as igniting a bomb, kicking down a brazier of fire, or shoot the ancient Greek versions of explosive barrels. You can also kick enemies off of ledges, sometimes for an instant kill. Keep in mind, this game came out two years before the movie 300. All of this variety adds up to a surprisingly worthwhile and engaging combat system. Even more commendable is how simple yet comprehensive the controls are. 
The player doesn't need to memorize combo chains or complicated inputs, instead it all comes down to pressing one of the four face buttons on the controller, and either holding L, R, or Z on the shoulder. It's all very intuitive as well. Given that R always brings up your guard, it makes perfect sense that pressing attack with R held down will use that shield to bash an enemy. L is the dedicated strong attack button, so modifying your attack to either the rage or super attack depending on if it's held down gently or all the way makes sense as well. Z is the dedicated bow button, A is the dedicated single enemy button, and B is the dedicated radial button. Only having to think about which attack to use with which modifier, two inputs, makes everything pretty straightforward, but also complex enough to not get boring. The only times where it can get a little confusing is with rolling and stabbing down enemies. Having to guard before pressing Y to roll slows the process down, and that specific button combination was somehow never fully ingrained in my head even after many hours of playing. This meant when taking fire damage, which is basically imminent death if you don't roll right away, I would oftentimes panic and begin jumping. It is my fault, but the fact that jumping is only used in a handful of instances in the entire game, and rolling is used on a regular basis, and essentially in every enemy encounter in the late game, it seems strange that jumping is the easier action to perform when in stressful situations. I know you can perform a jumping attack, but I still don't think that's as important as rolling is, but then again, perhaps that's an argument for the fire damage being too punishing. It's also unfortunate that pressing X could either activate a nearby environmental object or kill a downed enemy. It doesn't happen often, but it can trip you up if you aren't careful. Adding on to the variety of attacks you can perform, there are four melee weapons that all have their own strengths and weaknesses. The Blades of Athena are extremely quick, which makes mowing down unshielded enemies a breeze. Beowulf's hammer is very slow, almost detrimentally so, but the radial attack can effectively plow right through a tough shield of the battalion like tissue paper. For most of my first playthrough, I avoided using this weapon at all costs given how sluggish it felt, but it's unmatched when facing a big group of tough enemies. It is bizarre that it's one of the worst ways to combat the skeletons, however. You're given this blunt weapon before the level when skeletons are first introduced, and they're the quickest enemies in the game, always running out of your range or attacking in the middle of your swing. I have to think this was on purpose, to trick players who made that seemingly logical connection that Blunt is strong against skeletons. One may conclude that since the only Blunt weapon in the entire game isn't even good at the one thing it's meant to be strong against, it's not worth using. At least, that's how I felt. I had a similar mindset with the Spear of Achilles, but one thing I haven't mentioned yet turned me around on both the Spear and the Hammer considerably. The Rage and Super Attacks are different depending on the weapon. The Blades of Athena have my favorite Radial Rage attack, as the Spartan can rush through and kill many weaker enemies automatically. The special move is pretty good as well, a lightning attack that clears out everything around the player. The Spear and the Hammer both have a sweep as their Radial Rage attack, but their magic attacks are very unique. The Hammer's Radial Super pounds the ground, launching every enemy around the Spartan. This is very useful when surrounded by an entire army, but it has one crucial drawback I'll talk about in a minute. The Spear's Radial Super lights it and the player on fire, and every attack, be it a shield bash or a normal swing, sets the enemies ablaze. I'm also pretty sure you're invulnerable during this buff, but I'm not entirely certain. After you take out the first real boss of the game, your regular sword and shield get super attacks as well. Your shield gets ingrained with the power of Medusa, so your radial super can turn many enemies around you into stone, and the concentrated super does the same thing, but to one enemy for much more damage. The concentrated supers of every weapon are most useful during tough boss fights, but beyond that it's usually better to use the radial super. One thing that kind of drags everything else down is how awkward it feels to swap weapons. If you're in the middle of an animation, be it the follow through of an attack, or even simply walking around normally, pressing the D-pad left or right doesn't work. It only works when you've completely stopped moving. Ignoring the fact that it just feels bad and unresponsive in a pinch, this also lowers the skill ceiling. If changing weapons while in the middle of a skirmish was possible without interrupting the flow of battle, players who want to push themselves to master the combat system could have more room to grow. It's hard to test since you can't actually do it, but I imagine being able to swap between the hammer, blades, and sword and shield rapidly could be very useful depending on how many different enemy types are in the group you're dealing with. At the very least, being able to use the Blades of Athena, swap over to the hammer quickly for the radial super, and switch back again without hassle would have been immensely helpful. On the topic of skill ceilings, 
on the surface, it may look like being able to cancel out of the fatality animation once the enemy is slain by pressing R is a good thing. The full animation takes some time to complete, so being able to speed that process up certainly makes it a more useful option in combat, and the extra timed button press adds complexity. However, there's never a reason to see that full fatality animation play out. It's always beneficial to R-cancel. This seems especially devious with the hordes of undead warriors, as R-canceling is nearly a requirement to be able to deal with them at a quick pace. Not knowing about the R-canceling turns a few sections into a chore, one so great that I actually just ran past on my first playthrough. So even though I would have liked to see the skill ceiling increased via quicker weapon swaps, this doesn't need to exist in the game. After you get the timing down, it's trivial to accomplish, but the fact that there's literally no benefit to not doing it, you just have to wonder why the animation needs to take so long in the first place. Maybe you could argue this was meant to give the Blades of Athena more utility, as the animation is quickest with that weapon, but if that's the case, I would then return to my previous argument that swapping weapons should be possible on a whim. The last thing I need to mention about the combat overall is how satisfying it feels to kill a single enemy. It's really a testament to the design team, as this isn't the case for so many other action games out there. When the whole appeal is to rack up kills that exceed the triple digits per level, it could have been so tempting to focus on the group combat first and foremost, since that's what the player will be doing most often. Instead, it almost seems that they work the opposite way, trying to get the feeling of a single kill on a helpless enemy to be as satisfying as could be. The main contributor to the combat feeling so good comes down to the one thing I literally can't show you, the rumble on the controller. Every kill sends a powerful vibration to your hands, accenting the heavy animation you see on screen. Another is the animation of the fallen soldier. They don't ragdoll or vanish or anything like that, they fall over in a believable way and stay there. As far as the enemies go, they're not bad, and I like how many variations there are in total. Plenty of them are analogous to others that exist in specific areas, but there were some that stood out as unique. The undead warriors need to be finished off with a fatality, otherwise they'll never die. The skeletons are easily the quickest enemies in the game. The barbarian gigante can throw other soldiers at you, which does do damage. And the purple-clad praetorians have two very distinct variations that get on my nerves more than any other. The big sword-wielding tall boys can't be blocked, meaning the only way to circumvent their attacks is to roll behind them. The smaller, flippy assassin enemies are the real pain, though. Not only do they have a quick slashing combo that's difficult to manage when in a larger group, they constantly roll around which gives them invincibility frames. Even when you have them pinned in a corner, it can still be tedious to land a single blow on them. When you have a big grouping of enemies that include those two types, it's significantly more challenging. Thankfully, if you're smart with your super and rage attacks, you can crowd control adequately enough to focus on them one-on-one. -on -one. The missions themselves were quite the surprise. They were much longer than I expected, some even taking me more than an hour to complete. Most were fairly linear, but in the middle of the game you're able to explore and become familiar with a few open areas. The Barbarian Village gives you opportunities to talk to people and learn where everything is before beginning the battle, and the big sprawling city of Athens provides even more areas to explore, even offering optional objectives that remind me of the run-of-the-mill open-world tick-box side quests we see so often these days. There are plenty of extra tasks throughout the game, but I don't really understand what is to be gained by doing them. I'm pretty sure you don't get more Spartan tokens at the end of the mission when you complete them, but I guess I can't say for sure. Some of these duties were kind of fun. I mean, I'll never shy away from burning a Roman's house down and seeing all of them run out screaming for their lives, but the fact that these don't really mean anything to the game is kind of weird. It would have been more interesting, for the case of the Roman homes, if the Archimedes mission later on was made easier because you took out so many of their spawn points. It would have given me the impression that my actions were actually shaping my playthrough, and given how difficult the Archimedes mission is, it would have felt nice to get a head start. I will say about the missions in general, not having an option in the menu to reload the previous checkpoint is a pretty big misstep. With how long the game goes without checkpoints sometimes, it can be pointless to continue if you've taken a lot of damage early on, thus I would sometimes let the enemies kill me. Another thing to keep in mind is that, because the missions are so long, the health shrines not coming back after they're used can be quite frustrating. It doesn't matter in the slightest on the more linear levels, but in Athens especially, spending an hour in a chapter only for the last objective to be made significantly more difficult because you've already used the health shrines in the area feels pretty nasty. 
In a way, you are the one screwing your future self over, but it's not clear on the outset how much you'll need to do in each level, meaning it's tough to know if you should ration health shrines or not. Escort missions seem to be the bane of many players, and Spartan Total Warrior is chock full of them. Right away in the opening mission, you need to escort the sappers to the proper location to plant an explosive, and this same explosives escort task is repeated in quite a few levels as the game goes on. I like that you can make them move faster by running at them from behind, though. The much more infamous escort mission of Spartan Total Warrior is undoubtedly the one with Archimedes. If I had to guess, this would be the place I would think most people got stuck on when they were younger. This is such a tall order, getting this doofus old man to his hideout. It can be doubly frustrating if you already used all the health shrines in the city, meaning they're gone for the rest of this level. If that's the case, the health you have at the start is how much you'll have for the whole process. The Romans you'll encounter escorting Archimedes are some of the worst ones too, like the big sword and assassin flippy guys. He tends to run off without you into danger before you're ready, yet if you get too far ahead of him, he won't move until you come back. He's an absolute pain. The whole escort is a comedy of errors as well. The first safe house is infested with Romans, so you have to run away. Then he seemingly gets lost and needs to ask for directions to the next safe house, and this is where things start to get really weird. I imagine the designers thought you were following him closely during this section, thus would aggro the Romans, but even when I did get close, they didn't begin attacking. I thought I had narrowly avoided a big combat encounter. So we then both run past again and successfully slip by without a fight, but then this happens. Archimedes is stuck looking around this corner. I can speed it up for you to really get the full effect. I had no idea what to do or how to proceed, and I really didn't want to start the whole mission over again. I eventually killed the Romans we snuck past anyway to see if that would help. However, they weren't able to fight back for some reason. They just stood there as I slaughtered their allies. Then, once I went back to Archimedes, he's all good to go. This whole scenario was even sillier on my second attempt, since of course I failed the first time. I know he will take the wrong turn, there are no enemies nearby at all this time. I stand there, eventually kill this random jobber stuck in a doorway, and the same thing ends up happening. We slip by unnoticed, Archimedes gets hung up on this corner peeking animation again, I have to slaughter helpless Romans who don't put up a fight. Archimedes then gets upset at the guy who gave the wrong directions, saying he almost got us killed. Yeah, bud, he almost got us killed. This is already one of the toughest and most tedious missions in the game, so this bug popping up in the middle of it is very unfortunate. By the way, I sure hope you were killing those Romans as you went, because getting to that safe house isn't a get out of jail free card. The other mission with Archimedes before this one was also pretty interesting, I think. He's giving a big speech in the town square, and you're tasked to protect him from any Romans who plan to assassinate him. They all spawn in the same places every time, so if you fail, you can basically run around to the correct spots without needing any prompting. Besides Archimedes and escort missions, there are a few other quests and objectives that stood out to me. The second mission was the first time the game caught me off guard, since not only was it presenting a quasi-stealth section in this hack-and-slash action game, you can have a say in how a few of these scenarios play out. You're encouraged to sneak past this battalion of enemies, but if you're feeling bold, you can take on the challenge and the game honors that decision. Since we're talking about this mission, let's hear that line one more time. Help us, they're gonna kill us later on! Before the Beowulf boss fight, you'll need to protect the village from incoming barbarians, but before that is what I really want to talk about. This magic ring of fire nonsense. You need to take out all of these tough enemies by pushing them into the magic fire, which kills anyone instantly. The hitbox on this ring of fire is so poorly conveyed, it's outrageous. It doesn't even seem to be consistent all the way around. For example, here, I have no idea how I didn't die, because right here, I died from touching a similar spot. It's just an irritating objective all around, and Electra screaming for you to be careful of the magic fire over and over again only made it worse. Be careful! That magic fire will kill you instantly if you touch it! Push the into the magic fire! The common video game trope of a doppelganger boss fight is here as well, and it unfortunately, like so often is the case, doesn't live up to its full potential. Supposedly this nemesis of yours has all your same moves and capabilities. With that in mind, I was hoping it would be a classic one-on-one -on -one duel that made me think about the game differently, giving me a taste of my own medicine. 
Instead, it mostly consisted of running around, trying to get the blue and green orbs that spawn in the room before he did. If he gets the orbs, he can do his big magic spear attack on you, which hurts a lot. If you grab them, you can block that attack, or do a super of your own. The orbs being so important meant that's essentially the focus of the entire battle. Even when you think you've backed him in a corner so you can finally have a proper fight, he runs off to nab some blue orbs. It's just such an underwhelming boss battle. The second fight with Sejanus is nothing spectacular, but I have to point out the lack of catharsis a player would feel after the killing blow. This has been a guy you've been chasing for a few missions now, and have already fought once. He's even killed one of your close allies. This is how his final moments and the cutscene afterwards play out. Sejanus is no more. Without his priestesses, he doesn't have the power to come back. Now Pollux can rest in peace. You don't get to see him collapse or anything in the cutscene, but even the killing blow is cut short. My hammer didn't even complete its full animation. It shot right into this cutscene. After the grueling aqueduct tunnel level, there's a Minotaur boss fight. I really like that they went full hog and made a gigantic arena for this encounter. It's not exactly a maze, but it was difficult to find him at times. This is also an example of a time where the extra enemies actually benefit the experience, as he would get distracted and charge at them instead. Him being so aimless in his path of destruction sold me on the idea that this was a wild and uncontrolled beast. The Colosseum is the last time you get to fight a gigantic army. As you enter in, the Romans and Gladiators are duking it out amongst themselves, and will keep fighting when you're battling both sides. This means you can kill all except two, and let them have their proper duel. Well, it's the thought that counts. Afterwards, this essentially turns into a gauntlet, one made grueling and exhausting thanks to the lack of a checkpoint in the middle, and flamethrower enemies that can kill you instantly when they die. I could easily imagine this section being very tedious for players who are eager to see the ending, but for me, I wasn't too bothered by having to redo everything again. This is the big precursor to the end boss fight against Ares. I haven't talked about the story at all yet, and there's not too much to critique about it, but I'll say everything I want to say about it right now. Basically, and I'm going to both spoil and abridge a lot here, Ares instigated the Roman invasion of Sparta. He caused all the chaos that thrusted the nameless Spartan into the role of the hero. He did it to draw out this unnamed Spartan to seek revenge, as the Spartan's mother was the handmaiden of Aphrodite, and that handmaiden revealed Ares' affair with Aphrodite to Aphrodite's husband. Ares then killed the handmaiden, which again was our character's mother, the gods banished Ares and granted the Spartan with godlike powers in case Ares were to come after him, and yeah, it's essentially a soap opera of the gods, which, I mean, I suppose is to be expected with this Greek setting. I have a few complaints about all of this. Ares says to complete his revenge, he needs to kill the Spartan, but I don't really understand why. He's already killed the handmaiden in retaliation for her revealing his affair. He's good. It's done so. If he really wants to get revenge from being banished, my guy, take that up with the gods, bruh. Maybe he's just putting extra work on Hades' plate with all this extra death he's spreading. I don't know. Him pulling the strings behind the Roman Spartan War makes perfect sense, though. Brewing up conflict is basically his MO. However, I think there was a serious missed opportunity with Tiberius' last line of dialogue. He says he was just following orders, which is a great beginning to a telling realization that Ares was playing both sides, even causing the downfall of Sparta. However, they don't follow through with it. He just points down to Ares, says he knows, and falls to his death. They then make the player wait a bit longer before Ares explains everything in a very long and drawn out monologue. It would have been a lot better, I think, for Tiberius to explain everything from his perspective in a cowardly attempt to save himself from death. Him revealing that Ares had orchestrated the invasion of Sparta would have fixed the pacing of the last scene. As it is now, Tiberius is a bumbling fool, we don't even get to see his death, and Ares drones on and on like he's Triple H opening up Raw with a 15 minute promo. So 
Anyway, Ares being the final boss is cool, and the fight itself isn't bad, but it's pretty clear at this point that the designers think that dying instantly to exploding enemies is completely fair and worth being punished for. I heavily disagree, and I don't understand why they felt the need to add in sappers of all enemy types into this last encounter. Ares is interesting enough on his own, but even if they wanted to give him the power to resurrect the dead all around him, they definitely should have all been undead enemies instead of archers and exploders. Finally, there's the arena mode, which pits you against waves and waves of enemies. The main game ties into the arena via secrets and chests throughout the levels, which is a really good reward that encourages exploration. Without these secrets, it's just you against an entire army, whereas activating a few of them can really turn the tide in your favor. You can get health and magic shrines, arrows, fire arrows, potion buffs, environmental hazards to utilize, and even extra soldiers to fight alongside you. The combat system feels so good in its own right that a pure hack and slash game mode was a smart decision. That, coupled with the overall setting of ancient Greek warfare, makes this a perfect inclusion in the grand scheme of things. Spartan Total Warrior is a fantastic little action game that doesn't overstay its welcome. The simplicity and subtle depth of the combat system turns every battle into a great time. The set-piece events are at worst forgettable, and at best incredible. The gigantic groups of enemies they were able to fit in a GameCube game blows me away, especially given the performance never faltered through my 20 hours of playtime. Even after playing many more refined action games that released long after Spartan, there's still a lot here that's worth coming back to. There are plenty of stumbles along the way, but for a first outing in this genre, Creative Assembly gave us a game that manages to stand the test of time. <laughs> Spartan. <laughs> Spartan.